them. When we grew up, America had a giant middle class. Who's been shrinking? Even if you've been breezing through the newspaper. The middle class has, is, disappeared. All the wealth, see, because what people made in 1978, they said about what they make now. A little bit for inflation. Wages have not improved. But the big rich people get all the money. Why? Because all the schemes are for quick return. Now, we told all of y'all, right in the cookbook, if you got money in the stock market, this was a month, two months ago, take your money out. Then it took a little dip, then the white folks said, we was getting ready to dump and suck all the money out, so we better hold it up a little bit. So they pushed it back up a little bit. But starting last week, that boy started headed in. And yesterday, over 724 points died. I don't know what it is today, but that's a dip. And if they don't make a comeback, that means your pension fund and everything else is gone. You're going to lose. The big white folks, they got theirs out a long time ago. You know why? They the ones that made it big. They blew it up like a balloon. Blew it up, blew it up. And so you didn't got smart from the Enron in 2002, the dip in 2007, right, in eight. So you I ain't put my money back in there. But after they blow it up from 600 to 800 to 1,000, then 1,500, 2,000, 24, 25, 2,600 top. Then the poor man get panicky. He puts in his money. His money is real. The other money is blowing, the white folks blowing it up. When you get enough of your money in there, real money, pension funds and all of that, then he takes your money out and the stock market fall. Who lose? Me and you. They don't lose a dime. They've been doing it forever. They control the stock market. I'm, I'm saying this, you cannot elect a good official, you can't find a good official, there's no way to get a good official, a good king, a good president, a good senator, you, you can't get them into the system. Therefore, the decline of America is imminent. The decline of America is imminent. Well, you like it or not? Nah, let's go on then. Whatever's going on, a lot have told you, if you do not go forth, he will chastise you with a punishment most painful. And he will substitute a people other than you. And you will not harm him in the least. For a lie is over all things omnipotent. Yastabdil means to exchange, to replace, uh, to substitute. The Quran talks about peoples, each people having a chance. And historically, you can see that leadership, rulership goes around the world. Nobody is a permanent ruler or leader in the world. Just like nobody is a permanent heavyweight champion, right? Nobody has a permanent basketball team that wins all the time, forever. Some of them might have a 10-year run. Some football teams may be Miami Dolphins type in the 76, and they just on the road for a while. But somebody coming along, and they're not going to put up with that. Pretty soon, the champion is going to get a little tired. The champion going to slow up. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because that's history. Right? And the champ, pretty soon, 
I remember a friend of mine, George Foreman, came back. One of my best friends was his trainer, Charlie Shaft. And they did a good job for a man in his late 40s. For, uh, what's his name to come back? It's a long time ago. Well, they long, oh, 20 years ago. George Foreman. But you know, you could see George when he was fighting. He was doing pretty good for his age. But he could see the punch coming, but he couldn't do nothing about it. He couldn't move. He's too old, too slow. Right? Imagine you in a ring. You can throw good punches, you can stand punches. But you oh, and you know that punch is coming. <laughs> and the guy's younger and faster. You can't get away. With an individual, that happens to the champion. Right? In our lifetime, how many champions we can have? One after another. What about national, governmental, historical champions? There was a time when America, whatever it did, it just went right along and just said, Brought Negroes over here, worked them until they couldn't sweat no more. Took all the land from the Indians, right? Brought in technology and used their, it couldn't help but become number one, right? All the natural resources, oil, great rivers, the Mississippi, the Missouri, oh man, it couldn't lose. When it come into wars, the big ones, they started overseas. World War I, 1914, right? To 1918. America didn't get in the war till 1917. All the big boys is tired, buddy. Russia didn't pull out of the war. <laughs> Germany and England and, and France slugging it out. America comes in full of food and Kansas wheat. Just what slaps everybody around? Wasn't that easy. He becomes a world leader. World War II, same thing. 1939. 1941, America came into war in December 7th, 1941. The end, might as well call it 1942. The war started in 1939. Everybody's tired already. America, no bomb dropped on America. Well, there was a couple of balloon bombs from Japan. You know, balloons, like they have weather balloons. They put a couple of bombs on uh, gas balloons, and some of them dropped in, two of them, I think, dropped in Oregon somewhere. Because you know what Oregon is, the woods. America was big. Everything going its way. Can't lose, right? Civil rights? Yeah, civil rights. Why, in World War I, they sent the Negro over to fight, and they had the Negro digging graves. <coughs> the French had lost a generation. They said, can we have those Negroes? You and your grandparents. They gave them to France. Do you know what? Them Negroes that fought the hardest spent the most time in the trenches and the most decorated troops in World War I. And when they got back here, some of the greatest lynchings was right here. When? 1919. Right after the war finished. Negroes lynched in there. And the great Tuskegee Airmen, right? They didn't lose nobody. Some people said they might have lost a few, but that was the, not in the air. Maybe technical glitches or something. No white folks did that. But you didn't get nothing for it. Right? <laughs> Y'all hear about blood and guts patent? The white kid said, yeah, our bloods and his guts. You know, in other words, he'll run you anywhere. You go and get killed, and he's getting the glory. But he had Negroes. The fact that Black Panther tankers, y'all ever heard of them? It was bad. The Negroes just whooping everybody. 
they came right back here and got the same lynching that they had been getting. And the German prisoners of war in the South could eat in restaurants when they had Germans out working. The Nazis, they could eat any, they'd take them anywhere to eat. The Negroes couldn't eat in that, and those were the Germans that was killing the white folks. Just to show you how racist people can get. But now, your homeboy is old. He's slow. When was the last time he won a war? Vietnam? He didn't win that. No. He didn't win Korea, neither. 1950, 51, 50, 53, they signed a ceasefire, which is in effect now. So the civil, the Korean War is technically still going on. Technically. They signed a ceasefire in 1953. Did America win the Korean War? It's probably a little dated for y'all to remember. What about Vietnam? You know how bad he got booked over there. He killed a lot of people, boy, but he got snot knocked all out of him. And he went over and killed a lot of people in 91, Gulf War. But you know, we celebrated three days ago the invasion of Iraq. You know how long that was ago? Fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago. He's still over there. What happened to him? He went over there talking bad and got the stew whooped out of him, slapped the snot out of that boy. Yes, he did. Remember how bad he was talking about Afghanistan? What happened to him? He's still in Afghanistan. What's happened to him? He's getting the snot whooped out of him. When you read history, this is the flow and ebb of dictatorships, empires, kingships. All of them at the end of their rule and they big and powerful, they try to use the military and the people have changed. They don't fight them confrontational. Big armies lined up and they blow you to bits. They sneak around in the dark. Now they use uh, drones. You can get in a drugstore and wear the Americans out. What does that mean for you and I? The world is changing. We weren't brought here accidentally. You just have to say, MashaAllah, we was put here for a reason. And I believe that reason is very historical. It's for us to affect the metabolic or historical changes in the world today for the good. Now, this is my belief. You can believe what you want. Now, if you don't go forth, a lot going to chastise you. This maybe don't have our name wrote on it. We'll be substituted. You know, have you ever noticed any substitution going on around already? Who used to be the favorite minority in America? The Negro. Is the Negro the favorite minority now? Mm. You might as well get used to it. In 2000, this is what they said, the Negro and the Latinos were supposed to be 39 million <clears throat> kind of even steep. One year later, they took out in front. Do you remember a few years ago in D.C., teenage pregnancies, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, wasn't that the biggest thing in D.C.? Does anybody remember that? Teenage pregnancy. How many teenage girls have you seen going down the street pregnant? Just say, how many African-American girls have you seen walking down Benning Road with children? 
<laughs> how many Latinos have you seen with children? And how many? What does that mean? They didn't ten million us in a few years. That's why you better learn how to speak Spanish and be nice too. Because they don't double up on you before it's over. Definitely. That's all. It's all at that time that they're going to. That's a done deal. You just see a little bit of it here. If you was in California, if you was anywhere else, a lot of y'all from the South, Carolina, down that way, right? When you was young, did you ever see a Latino? Did you ever see a, Mex a Spanish sign in Carolina when you was growing up? Did you ever hear of Spanish? It was two people in Dixie. Boss man and the Negro. Right? That's it. It ain't like that no more. <clears throat> Tell the truth. It's changing. Substitution. Historical elimination. Transitional changes. If you don't go forth, Civil rights, what do they go? Where do we go back to? This is, we go back 50 years to 1968 or 1963 to march on Washington. Have nobody did nothing since then, right? Tell the truth. Nah, I mean, we know boss man, infiltrators, turn everybody to tattletales, and you can't do that. I don't, we're not blaming anybody. Boss man is pretty slick. But you can overcome boss man. What you got to do is you have to go forth. Whether equipped lightly or heavily. And now, Allah says he sent tranquility down on him. Asakina. That's a special God giving given peace. But he didn't wasn't sending a Sakina down on the prophet Sallallahu son. The prophet wasn't nervous. It was Abu Bakr. They were nervous. Remember the second is two. And they was in a cave. Now not a big cave. They was in a little indentation. And if you, they said, if you would have looked down, it would have been all over. The thread of history is hanging on the two of the most weakest elements in the world today. A bird's nest and a spider's web. History is hanging on a spider's web. That's what the book say, y'all done read it, right? It's all of us as well. They had the pigeons and it can't be nobody inside. If you just look down, now you just saw your feet. You see what I mean? Do you see how powerful a loss of the Watawa is? Using the weakest elements in his creation to uphold the strongest pillars ever created the religion of Islam and the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was hanging on the weakest elements. That's why Allah is telling us, you go forth. You don't have to have whether equipped lightly or heavily. Now, this word here, go forth in jihad whether you are light and agile, being young, or you are heavy and slow, being aged. You see? So when it is talking about light or heavy in all aspects, whether you got light money, whether you got arthritis, rheumatism, your vision is going bad. You have to walk around the block to warm up because you're 70, 75, 80 years old. 
or whether you just spry and you just jump up and get busy when you're young and agile. This is the book speaking to you and I. I'm going to try to speed up. And so just go for whether equipped lightly or heavy. There's some discussion here. I but fulfill towards you from last week the duties of my Lord's mission. Sincere is my advice to you, and I know from Allah something that you do not know. Do you wonder that there had come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people to warn you so that you may fear Allah and happily receive mercy. Do y'all remember the old days we sent in brother so-and-so is going to Saudi Arabia to learn Arabic? And he going, they coming back and teach Islam. Later on, they was going to Syria. A lot of our brothers took HIFS programs in South Africa, but mostly in Pakistan. The only thing about the HIFS program, that's the recitation of Quran, you learn perfect recitation. The only thing is that the people teaching you the HIFS Quran don't know what they're talking about, and you won't know what you're talking about. Because you can recite the Quran from cover to cover. You get a certificate. I am Hafiz of Quran. You can recite it with beautiful recitation, with Tajweed. But, but you don't know the Arabic language. So you can get up like in our programs and recite all oh, the people who start crying. But what are we looking for? How many of those people came back and taught anything about Islam? None of them. You got old batches of them. They came back and they got on the uh, circuit. What circuit is that? The Isna circuit, the Ikna circuit, the mass circuit. We was over Dar Hidra, the big Negro imam from New York, the great speaker. They just came one night in prayer and raised thirty-six thousand dollars for men. Have you did you have you seen anything happen to men? All the, all that money that was raised around the country, nothing. And they told the brothers, well. We don't want to be a threat. We're not a threat to mass. Mass is immigrant guys. They're worried about their green card. They don't about no Islam. And when they do work with brothers, big masjid out, out the way, Pakistani brothers get it started real good. Here come the Ikwani types want to take over. Because they got a little old funny program. And they do it here, they do it anywhere they go. They're not worried about Islam, they're worried about their party, their group, right? Now, here's the Negro, me and you. Go forth, whether equipped lightly or heavily and strive and struggle in the way of Allah with your goods, lives, and property. This is Tawakkul and Tafweed. Tafweed is to delegate your whole future to Allah. You just put it in Allah's hands. It's like Tawakkul, but it's a little higher. And as you moving along and struggle, you using plenty of tawakka. But when you go for big, 
his tough weed. That means you delegate all of that to Allah. Why? Because Allah has showed you if he can put a, a, a bird's nest in the spider's web and the whole pendulum history is swinging on them too and it comes out fine. What about you and I? I'm going to get to that in a minute. And no big eyes and, and thinking it ain't possible. Do you wonder we might as well call it what it's not exactly saying, but it means that. Do you wonder they have come to you a message from your Lord through a man of your own people to warn you so that ye may fear Allah and happily receive mercy? Well, is it a big deal? It is kind of funny to hear something coming from the Negro because of all the scholars around here never say nothing about nothing. You can slaughter Muslims anywhere in the world and go to Juma and they won't mention it. They haven't mentioned it. Nowhere in the region, I don't know, maybe y'all, if you've been somewhere and you're here, that we have to stand up for Islam, we have to help the Muslims, just let me know. I'll be happy to go over there. I don't hear. Maybe you do. Who's it fall on? It falls on me and you. But I don't know enough Arabic. You don't need to. You know what go forth in the cause of Allah mean, right? You know, the people that know all the Arabic is one messing up. Saudi Arabia is a home of Arabia. And they messing up more than anybody. The biggest bums in the world. The most useless, as the Negro call them, Arabs in the world. Everything for the benefit of these bums here. These bums trying to fall over and the Saudi run by with a prop and a jack to hold it. Don't let boss man tip over. Boss man, you tilted. Right? Okay. Now, this is not arrogance, but I think we were sent here for a reason. We're going to try. I'm going to do a little skipping. And we're going to go somewhere that we have been before. A lot of lives have been lost. A lot of children have lost their faith. We don't have any liberating institutions. But we won't say we don't have any. We have ours. And we're going to tell you about ours, and it's not bragging, and it's not being fearful. It's just telling you from a message from our historical environment. 68 was a big year. 68 was a big year for Negroes, too. You turn on the TV and see the temptations in 68. You couldn't see that before. That would be. Well, you might have seen them once or twice, 65, 66, you know. But you know, you could watch TV in the early 60s. And don't talk about the early 50s. <coughs> you wouldn't think it was any black people in America. Does anybody remember that? Remember them little 13 inch TVs? You could watch TV. It was no Negroes in commercials. They had. 1952 or three, they had Beulah. I don't know if y'all remember that. Y'all remember Beulah, so she was. She was, a, she was a maid. The only good program was Amos and Andy. Now people, would, they make fun of it. During the black days, they took it off because they made us look kind of funny, but it was humorous. The black nationalists had it taken off the TV in the 60s because it was demeaning. I was with them, but I didn't like what they said. I just didn't have enough nerve to tell them 
that that's my favorite program. And I like what them niggas do. And on top of that, our main strategy in success comes from a portion of Kingfish, Andrew H. Brown, yes, and Andy, even Lightning. Y'all don't remember Lightning. <laughs> because they put something there <coughs> to make fun of the Negro, but when you use the script of the Negro, on homeboy, he don't even recognize it. You have to stop and tell him, boss man, we just ran this game on you. I know you don't know what it is, but that's what we did. We're going to call it Kingfish. For now. Okay. I'm going to tell you where we're trying to go, but before that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of D.C. Uh, we came here in 89. We came here in 89 from Oakland. We had a 1973 Fiat station wagon and some books. Uh, we went to Canada to a program and sold books. And we sold $1,800 worth of books. So we came here with the residue of those books and 19 and 1800 cash. And with the whole you United States government and the Negroes here working in harmony to prevent any progress at all, we now have eight properties in D.C. that we paid for. <coughs> Do any other questions? I'm just asking, this is now material so you understand. Does any other Negroes or anybody else have eight pieces of properties fully paid for? of their own. Does anybody that was in the mix, is it anybody that everybody turned against and for what reason? Do you know when they attack our masjid in, in Oakland with guns, and I'm talking about the regular stuff that you see on TV, a terrorist raid, of course on the dear brother, big terrorist, We had three programs, maybe four, in front of CARE. <coughs> CARE is supposed to handle stuff like that. Is that right? CARE don't care. If it was a hijab issue, they might have cared. But they won't even, they wouldn't even, one day, they peeked out the window a little bit. After that, they wouldn't even peek out the window. We out there with a loudspeaker. All kind of suburbans. Probably one little talk, it must have been seven or eight FBI, CIA suburbans driving by. And we just give them the finger. We don't give them the finger. But, so, this is what we did here. We have been successful here in D.C. Don't worry about five or ten people. That's not important. But I'm going to tell you why it's not important right now. So, for what we have in D.C. and what we have in Oakland is research laboratories. That's what here is. When you go and listen to this stuff on the cameras and all that, it's for everybody to watch and listen and then research. Research. Man, that nigga sound like he's lying. You hear what he's saying? He's lying. That's why we talking so you research. That's what you public is supposed to do. You're supposed to do your research. For this period, this is the Negro that worked right in front of the system. Slapped him upside the head, kicked him in the behind, called them punks and everything, and everybody hides from the FBI. Isn't that right? You've heard no gangsters or nobody ever tell the feds they're a bunch of punks over and over again. Isn't that right? And have the program how to punk the FBI and go down to their, y'all haven't seen the fly, to their office. That's way back when, 2007. 
Y'all ain't nothing but a bunch of sissies in there. Come on out of here. Here I am. What you talking about? Just having fun. They can't do nothing about it. You know what they do? They come out. How are you, Mr. Reams? Could I have a fire? That's my statement. Say, yeah, you can have one. Or they try to question you sometime, you're coming in from Iran or somewhere. Sit up straight when you're talking to me. What's wrong with you? Then you know, the other guy ahead him and said, yeah, you should have decent. Put a smile on your face. Who are you rolling your eyes at, sucker? You wouldn't talk to him like that, because you probably got some skeletons in your closet or something. You don't, pay, don't want to do no time. Plus, you think the white man is bad. Yes, you do. You might as well tell the truth. You think he's bad. He was the champ. Who, who does not whip it? The Chinese whip it. Germans whip it. Everybody is whooping boss man. Your job and my job in America with Islam to help bring the people well, how can I put it? You know, in the old days of decolonization and all of that, the nationalists came through in whatever country we was on. So whether it was India or whether it was in Africa, whether it was in Algeria, the FLN, the nationalist forces took the wind out of the sails of the Muslims. So they were nationalist challenges to colonialism. The Islamic forces in most places did not lead the charge in decolonizationism. It was mostly nationalist, leftist organizations. Whether it's Algeria, wherever it was. But in this transition, the world, it seems like, will be led through this traumatic era to liberation, to truth and freedom via Islam. If you don't believe it, watch the news. What's on the news? Every day, Islam, right? Don't worry about him saying something bad about his son. You remember, if your mama or daddy told you, don't play with that boy up the street, he's a bad boy. Right? But don't mess with that girl, she's got a bad little character. So when you went out the window to go play, who did you go looking for? Same one they told you to stay away from, is that right? It's the human nature. Stay away from the Muslims, right? The Muslims are bad. How are Americans? Suppose I got this apartment right there on the first floor, and I got Haran and somebody OD. Walk out the door and fall dead, OD. Will I lose my customers? Everybody's going to come there. Because it's OD dope, isn't that right? <laughs> right? In fact, I ought, if, I, if my customer load is a little lower, I ought to oh, hit somebody and OD them, and I get all the customers in town. Everything they tell you to stay away from in America, people want to find out about it. The growth in Islam in America is not by dollar, it's by the media. Now I'm going to get to what, to what we have to do. Now we don't do, do our job. This is our shot now. We don't do it. You see what it says. It's going to, you're going to be exchanged. Mexicans will be coming back. Brother, come to Islam. 
You know Islam, brother? That's right. If you don't go for it, Allah going to exchange you. You don't have no permanent place. Right? And if you do your job, the world will listen to you. Do not listen to that don't nobody like Negroes. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are the most popular civil rights activist liberation people in the world, aren't they? Tell the truth. In the world. And music, no matter how bad some of our stuff is, they rapping for the last 20 years in Russia. Turn on Chinese TV, the Chinamans is rapping and whatever they call it, hip-hop Chinamans. They hip hop it down in Tahiti in the islands with grass skirts on. Yes, they are. You think I'm lying? Keep everybody pays attention to the Negro. When I was in South Africa, the people would ask me questions in more detail about the Negro. I said, I don't know all that about the people of the Negro. Except one big white man at the, at the school. It was a Ford Trekker. Ford Trekker, I mean, it's Ford Trekker, you know, in Dutch uh, Pioneer School. And I came to the school, and they was, the assembly was there, and they was singing Amazing Grace. So when I came up, I told them, this is a wonderful song. It's almost a national anthem. I said it was a, a slave on a slave ship captain wrote that song. You know, Amazing Grace saved a wretch like me. He was a slave ship captain and turned to Jesus, of course, and he wrote the song. So I was telling them, by that time it was integrated, but these white folks, all the teachers still white, he says. They said, well, they was a shock that. They were singing Amazing Grace and didn't know. Uh, excuse me, brother, you have to wake yourself up. If you want to do that, excuse me, go over to uh, Darl Hendry. You can go to sleep in nature. We start to do a little rebellion here. So if you want to sleep, they have nap, they have pillows for you over there. Yeah, and the refrigerator, you can go have a little snack. <clears throat> okay, so Amazing Grace was the was the song, and then when it was over, <laughs> the head professor, he was walking me to the car, and he said, you're the first Negro I have ever met. Did I get mad? I had fun. I said, yes, I am a 100% Negro. I'm a pure Negro. I come from Negro stock, Negro history. Everything about me is pure Negro, one eighth Indian, and all of that. You know what I mean? The pure Negro. I was just having fun. Why well, you're the? He didn't know to say after you're the first black person I met from America. He was old, so he said that's when they call us Negroes. I wasn't mad at him. I said, Yes, I am a 100% Negro. <laughs> you know. Anyway. That's what we have to offer people. And I'll get to the point right now. Okay. So, we didn't already prove that we could survive. We didn't already prove visual visualizations and dreams because 1968 was a big year. I don't know about y'all for me. It was a big year. You know, I was a youngster. Visualizing brohams, limousines, Cadillacs, businesses. Cadillacs. Just visualizing. You know where you visualize yourself driving down the street in a big limousine? Of course, now, you know, a few years ago we were down there picking cotton in Arkansas, and you dreaming of something that is almost impossible. When one year later, all that was done in, in spades. One year later, dreaming about coming to here or anywhere else. When we got here, people was dead on Islam. 
the government had worked and twisted the Muslims so bad, wasn't nobody even thinking about it, not really. The only one left in the Islamic movement in D.C. was police. And here we are, with the whole system trying to finish us off. I'm trying to tell you, and here we are. No headaches, no stomach aches, no nothing. Now, where do we have to go from here? Okay, get out your dreaming cap, get out your vision cap. Where should we be going from here? Uh, there's a world out there that needs Islam, and during this period, the mission is not to bring everybody to Islam, but that Islam should lead this reconciliation period. So where do we need to be in our next stage of development? We talk about world-class organizations, but we need to be as institutions. We need to have the power of a medium-sized country. We do, me and you. Let's say like Mexico or something like that. The power, the ability, the resources. Right now, we are attacking problems of America. Number one, drugs. So we'll start treatment center. Number two, homelessness. So we'll turn the property we have in Oakland everywhere, we'll turn it homeless. We're gonna go to our preacher friends, the ones that we do have, and say we people should solve the problems in America because our religion demands it. Stop asking the government for anything. Right? Now, think about it. The homeless. In D.C., if the churches, the Masajid, took up two issues, homelessness, and housing, right in D.C. If the churches did the work that Jesus did, right, remember, who was Jesus with? Remember Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor, right? Jesus spent all his time with poor people. And it was his job, according to the Bible, to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils. That means psychological problems, that's their job. All these other problems, that's our job. The only thing we got to do is get the preachers to realize we got to try to live like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he say? When I get raised up, I want to be raised up with the poor. Remember the hadith on neighbors? Neighbors, remember the hadith? You were exhorted to help your neighbor so much that some of the people thought they would become part of the inheritance. Isn't that right? So our religion, our ways of life, all we got to do is convince the imams that we want to do the same as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. When people came with needs, the deen helped the people with the needs they have. Isn't that right? And we want to get the preachers to know, hey man, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, not on a bench, nor was it a BFW, nor a chariot of the time. Right? All we have to do is remind the preachers, there ain't going to be no easy job, to 
do the work that Jesus did. Right? That would solve we, the religion, solve the problem. Stop asking the government. The government was created for its own needs. Let it go off and start wars. If you're dumb enough to go fight for it, go ahead. We say we make the world a better place. Now we're going to need a little money and people will do it. But that's what we're going for this time. Now you say that, boy. Remember, all we said was, we're going to practice what God gives us. Tough weed. To walk will work 100%. Put not trust in the law. Now, tough weed is a little higher. Very similar. Putting your trust, confidence, delegating your authority, your, your, all authority to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go out and do good. So you got a clear goal. We want to be... Now, this is nasty talk, but it's true. If you don't have no money in the world today, you in bad shape. Tell the truth. Am I lying? Nobody gonna look at you, wanna hear nothing to you, from you. So our goal is to have money to use it as a tool. Money is a tool, not a recreational device. Okay, that's going to take a lot of training because money people don't think they think money ain't a tool. Now I'm not talking about little money. We're talking about billions of dollars. You don't know how we're going to get billions of dollars, do you? My belief is we're going to get them. Why not? It's easy. It's possible. Can you imagine? Now, I'm just talking about personally, every dream I had, I got. I got every last one of them. Every one of them. Now, this one is fully feasibly locked. So it was a couple of them before, but this is fully Islamicized feasibly locked. I don't want no billion dollars up five, ten, one. Remember, I say we want to be as powerful as a, a medium country like Mexico. I mean, we want to have our own agencies. We want to solve the problems of America. And I want you to see what happens as you get going. Pretty soon the people see it. That stuff ain't work. That is not work. They taking their zakat money, and they got people that was homeless, they didn't turn their auditorium into a living space for the homeless. It is a three-star homeless shelter, three and a half star. Yeah. You don't, in our homeless shelter, we're not going to have no big drums or just stew and stuff. Why'd you see? If you work there, if you be alive, you're going to go ask the homeless man, what would you like for breakfast, brother? What is your order? You don't think homeless should be treated like that, do you? That's because we haven't been studying our religion. Homeless people were always elevated, and guess what? Do you remember Ali Sufa? You know who they was? Anybody know who Ali Sufa was? The people that lived in the loft in the masjid including Abu Huraira and all of them, right? Y'all remember now? They were treated as honorable people. Some of Ali Sufa is where you get half of your hadith from. People was living in the masjid off the people. The people brought them and treated them kind, not like homeless and bums. We're going to treat people, that's our religion, we're not, it's not extra. Ain't nobody asking you for nothing extra. Read the Quran. Read what it says about poverty, neighbors. Read all the hadith. Go ahead and read it. In fact, I'm not even saying it like it really is. It's more strict on that. Homeless, drug addiction and all of that. They now talk about it. Did you hear that fool Don said, we want to dope, we want to kill them. Death penalty for dope dealers. 
the opiates ain't coming from no niggas. The big companies produce all that oxycontin and all that, right? What happened last year? The DEA and the two biggest people in the DEA quit. Why? Because they filed cases on the drug companies and the big people right up in and around the White House told them, leave them people alone. <laughs> right? They're not going to solve no... Okay. I'll finish with this. I was a drug dealer. I started in California. Went down to Mexico. I used to smuggle cocaine from uh, Colombia. But you know, I went to Peru and Bolivia first. The CIA told me to go to Colombia. Because that's the spot. The CIA told me to go to Colombia. In those days, it wasn't what it is now. They said, this is the spot. And we got friends up there. And I went up to Columbia, and they almost met me, following me around. And what do you need? And this is how you do that. If they going to put the dope dealers in jail, they're going to have to kill all of the FBI, CIA, and all them people first. Right? That's what they're going to have to do. You think Don going to get rid of them? It ain't going to work. So part of our struggle, Sabakun Liberation Organization, is to help liberate people from all of the gravitational pulls of the earth. Sabakun Liberation Organization. All the gravity. And what we're going to use, and I'm going to close, we're going to use reverse uh, law lies tongueism. Y'all remember the Quran when it talked about the guy? And then disbelieve. He just, like a dog, if you throw something at him, he loves out his tongue. If you leave him alone, he loves out his tongue. Isn't that right? This is what is reverse love out his tongue, isn't it? Well, I can just tell you what it is. Reverse law artist tongueism is the exact reverse. This person was who he is because he or they refuse the signs of Allah. Since they refuse to accept the signs of Allah, right, they made their nafs their illa. Their nafs. They're Illa. Illa is a little god with a little g. So that type of person, it don't make no difference what you do to him. If you throw something at him, like a dog, he loves out his tongue. If you're nice to him, he loves out his tongue. Why? Because, I'll read this and wrap it up. Relate to them the story of the man to whom we sent our signs. Allah sent him a sign. But he passed by them. So Satan followed him up and he went astray. If it had been our will, we should have elevated him with our signs. But he inclined to the earth, remember? You go forth, you cling heavily to the earth. And follow his own desires, nafs. His similitude is that of a dog. If you attack him, he loves out his tongue. If you leave him alone, he loves out his tongue. That is a similitude of those who reject our signs so relate the story, perchance they ref may reflect. Reverse law out his tongueism mean the characteristic of the person that recognizes signs. Remember, it's an automatic opposite. The one that loves that, that 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 
rejects the signs, the one that don't see the signs, Ayatollah, that don't see Allah's signs, or reject the signs. I don't want to hear those signs of God. I don't want to, I don't want to hear them. I don't want to see them. I reject them. That guy has a certain behavior. What determines his behavior? His nafs. He followed his own desires. In Arabic, his nafs. His nafs became his God. Satan followed him up and his behavior pattern is chiseled in stone. That's what he do. Because when you reject, reject a lot of signs, right, and you follow your own nafs, <laughs> right, you, it produces a certain type of behavior. No matter what happened, if you treat the guy nice, he going to backfire. If you mess with him, he's going to still do the same thing. The reverse is this. The people that see a law sign, that accept the law sign, that say, I don't care what nobody do, I'm going to get out of shot. Yeah, I'm going to get out of shot. That's what I'm going to do. I don't care if everybody laughs. I don't care what they do. I'm going to give that a shot. And I'm going to follow the Hidayah, the guides. I'm going to follow where the signs ayats, you know, 6,242 ayats in the Quran. Every one of them is an ayat. Every one of them is a sign. Every one of them is a direction. Every one of them is hidayat. And if you follow them, it's going to develop your character. And it don't make no difference what nobody do to you, what nobody say to you, you're going to do that. You're home free. You're subject to get the best of this world. It's going to scare you a little while. You've got to get used to this. You live in a world that don't do right. So now here you are, uh, 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 trying to do right. <laughs> the homeboy around the corner done went crazy. He's trying to do right. What is your relative saying? When you had five girlfriends, drank whiskey, uh, shot dope all the time, and had a couple of pretty girls, this is my nephew, this is my son, I like him. You remember? He's all right. If you had five girlfriends and wouldn't marry none of them, he's shot. My boy is shot. Then you'll come in and say, I find the sister, uh, Dad, I'm going to marry that girl. She has four kids, but it's all right. I'm going to look out for them, too. And I ain't getting high no more. The word don't get out. My poor boy went crazy. Isn't that right? He was a Muslim. He was a Muslim. Negro said Muslim. Right? He was a Muslim now. And he go down to that Muslim church, and the nigga is praying. I'm not praying before he go to bed. Like, no! <coughs> that boy, something happened to him. I seen him pray three times in a day myself. I wasn't with him but a few hours. He prayed, he told me, five times a day. And I'm going to close with this. It was a big meeting down at uh, the convention center, the old convention center. The Black Caucus had uh, something in there. Betty Shabazz was there. Uh, Reverend Stallings was there. The professor of divinity over at Howard was there. And the blind going Negro, you know, the, what's the? John Henry Clark. John Henry Clark. Boy, he talked about the Muslims. And we were wanted to kind of whoop him. He's blind, old man, so we couldn't. Muslims are nothing but disgruntled Baptists, is what he said. So everybody saw the Muslims was getting a little mad. So Howard Divinity came up and said something nice about Islam. But old Stalin's, that was the dancing. Remember Doug Stalin's, the, the, the Catholic? He was. A, he manned church. When I came here, he was party. 
he gave a speech. He says, Muslims, <laughs> he did a little jig. He says, Muslims pray five times a day. He said, I have never. He was a big preacher, right? Remember the stories? I never prayed five times a day. Right? And when you tell them, they say, you done went crazy. Because you pray <laughs> to God and you don't want but one girl, the one you're married to. Ain't that crazy? Huh? That's what we're going to do. Oh Allah, we seek thy refuge from anxiety and grief. We seek thy refuge from lack of strength and laziness. We seek thy refuge from cowardice and niggardness. We seek thy refuge from being overpowered by death and the oppression of men. O oh Allah, suffice us with what is lawful, keep from us what is prohibited, but thy grace make us free from want of what is beside thee. Amen.